an arbitrary field of characteristic zero. X will be an n-tuple of variables, x1, xn. And I will look at the ring of formal power series. or at the ring of convergent power series, ON. So that is KX. Of course, in this uh, case, I'm assuming that K is equipped with um, an absolute value and that K is complete with respect to this absolute value. Things will be valid for formal power series and convergent power series. So in most cases, I will use a general notation A sub n. It will be either Fn or On. OK, so let's take two elements, F and G that are in AN, and I will consider right equivalence between these elements. So I will say that F is equivalent to G. By definition, if and only if, there exists an isomorphism, K isomorphism of AN, which transforms one power series into another. So there exists H, an isomorphism, a k-isomorphism, such that h of f is equal to g. Of course, we know that h is ac actually determined by an n-tuple of power series, so we can always assume that h is of the form little h star, where, where little h is h1, hn, each h1 up to hn is in an, h1 of 0 is hn of 0, and the determinant of the, 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 determinant of the Jacobian matrix is, of course, different from 0 at zero. So, of course, capital uh, little h of f, it is f circle h. So we are just uh, changing variables. And the equivalence means that after a change of variables, one power series is equal to another power series. And the general problem that I want to address is find criteria, well, give criteria for F to be equivalent to a polynomial. We saw such criteria yesterday. Let me recall briefly. Dimitri talked about the notion of a finite determinacy of a power series. So he reminded us that the following conditions are equivalent. F is finitely determined. If and only if a certain power of the maximal ideal, so there exists a k 
a positive integer such that the kth power of the maximal ideal is contained in the ideal generated by the partial derivatives of f. Okay, and of course, this condition is equivalent, that is a well-known general fact, to the statement that the dimension of the over k of the vector space a n modulo the ideal generated by the partials is finite. And as Herbig insisted yesterday, finite determinacy means in particular that f can be transformed into a polynomial. That is clear. It's enough to take a, polynomial, a Taylor polynomial of f of sufficiently high degree, and the definition of finite determinacy will tell you that f is equivalent to such a polynomial. So I'm not going to talk about uh, this anymore. It is just to review things. I would like to find a slightly more general conditions which guarantee that f is still equivalent to a polynomial. To formulate such conditions, it is convenient to introduce some notation. So let me take f in a n. Of course, in all types of theorems of, uh, that I'm going to talk about, it is not important what f of zero is. I, without any loss of generality, I can assume that it is zero. So even if I don't write explicitly, I will usually assume that f of zero is zero. And to avoid a trivial situation, let's suppose that it is different from zero. And then, of course, I can write down a factorization of f into irreducible power series. So I can write f as, say, epsilon, f1 to the power lambda 1, dot, 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 fp to the power lambda p. So what is epsilon here? I can always arrange so that epsilon is actually a non-zero constant, non-zero element in the field. So epsilon here is in k star. F1, Fp are in An, irreducible and relatively prime. And relatively, and relatively prime. And of course, these exponents are positive integers. So lambda 1 up to lambda p are in z plus z greater than 0. Of course, this expression is not unique because f1 up to fp are determined only up to units. This epsilon is also not uniquely determined. If k is algebraically closed, then of course I can incorporate epsilon in the f, so we could always assume for k algebraically closed that epsilon is 1. If k is r, the real numbers, then as epsilon we could take plus or minus 1, but in general we could not take plus 1 only. But all the definitions will be independent on, of the form of this expansion, of this representation. So let me denote this expression by a star, I will refer to it. If I refer to a star, then it means that these conditions are satisfied. Okay? All right. And now I will introduce a certain matrix and a certain ideal that will be important for, for the statement of a theorem. It is convenient to introduce uh, these notions in a slightly more general context than strictly speaking, necessary for the statement of the theorem. So, I will take F1 up to Fp, completely arbitrary elements, not necessarily irreducible. 
let me denote by F arrow, the p tuple of these elements. And then let me introduce the following matrix. M of F arrow is by definition the following matrix. F1, Fp on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else, and here is another portion of this matrix, the partial of F1 with respect to X1, the partial of F1 with respect to Xn, the partial of Fp with respect to X1, the partial of Fp with respect to Xn, Okay, so that's the matrix. So we have P rows and P plus N columns in the matrix. And let's define I of F arrow to be the ideal of A N generated by the P by P minors of M of F. Okay, so we have a certain ideal. And now suppose that we take F expressed as in this case. So F is epsilon, F1, lambda 1, F, P, lambda, P. So S in star. And then it is convenient to introduce a certain ideal associated with F. JF, this is by definition the ideal written here. So it is I, F1, F, P. F arrow, in this case, is this p tuple of elements where this irreducible uh, power series come from the representation of F in the correct form. One remark, this ideal is independent of the choice of this representation. This is a trivial exercise, of course. If you change epsilon, if you change uh, these irreducible factors by units, then nothing will be changed in this ideal. So it is completely independent of the choice. Good. With this notation, I can state the first theorem. Theorem one, given f, f of zero equal to zero, f different from zero, the following conditions are equivalent. Condition A, f is I will write down the condition, but I have not introduced the, the appropriate notion yet, so I apologize for that. I will write down the theorem and then introduce the notion. Sorry about that. So F is weakly, finitely determined. I will write down what it means in a moment. Condition B, there exists a positive integer such that the power, the kth power of the maximal ideal is contained in the ideal J of F. And condition C, the dimension of over K of A N modulo, the ideal J of F, is finite. Okay, so this undefined uh, statement here definition 
we say that F is weakly K determined if every G in A N of the form G is epsilon G1 to the power lambda 1 dot 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 GP to the power lambda P where G1 GP are arbitrary elements in AN with GI minus FI in M to the power K plus 1 for I from 1 up to P is equivalent to is equivalent to F. Okay, so I'm modifying each irreducible factor separately by higher order terms. The difference between GI and FI is consists of higher order terms. And if such a modification is done, then the condition that I'm imposing is that uh, such power series are equivalent. And of course, we'll say that F is weakly finitely determined if it is k-determined, weakly k-determined for some k. So F is weakly finitely determined if it is weakly k-determined for some k. some k. Okay, so there are some obvious remarks that one can make. The definition of weakly k determined and the definition of uh, weakly finitely determined does not depend on this expression. If you change this expression to another of the same type, nothing is affected um, by such a change. So that is the first trivial remark. The second trivial remark, if f is weakly, finitely determined, then of course it is equivalent to a polynomial. Yes? Uh, at the very beginning you assume that uh, the field is complete with respect to the evaluation. Yeah. Do, do you really need it for the statement? For the statement, I think that uh, in the case of um, convergent power series, it is needed somewhere. Okay, so the second remark was this, and a third remark. I will write it down, although it is also fairly trivial. It's also fairly trivial, but I will write it down. If F is finitely determined, then, sorry, and lambda is an integer greater than or equal to 2, then f to the power lambda is not finitely determined. But it is weakly finitely determined. 
it's a trivial remark. Of course, f to the power lambda cannot be finitely determined, and that follows right away from, from the criterion that I recalled. I think it is on the, other, on the other board, because if you take the exponent greater than or equal to 2, if you compute the partial derivatives, then each partial derivative is divisible by f, and therefore uh, the ideal generated by the partial derivatives of, uh, this, of this power series cannot contain a power of a maximal ideal. The last statement is a trivial consequence of the definition of weakly finitely determined. All right. So now, this statement is clear. We know what weakly finitely determined means. A comment about, yes? Yes. Of course, it is weakly, finitely determined, and of course it is uh, equivalent to a polynomial. For that, you don't need actually a notion of uh, uh, weakly, finitely determined. And this is just equivalent for a polynomial from the definition of finitely determined. That's true. But fortunately, there are other examples of uh, power series, not of this type, which are weakly finitely determined, because if these were the only examples, then the whole thing would be pretty silly. Okay, a comment about this. I will prove this theorem with the exception of one implication. So, the equivalence of B and C is a well-known statement, well-known in general. So that is well-known. I'm not going to comment about that. B implies A. That is, I think, the most interesting uh, implication in this theorem, and I will prove it later. And I will skip the proof that A implies B. It's not difficult, but I'm not going to talk about it. It will be omitted. Is the situation easier when F1 to Fp for the complete interaction? Yes, sure. It is easier. If you don't have singularity at, uh, at the origin, you mean complete intersection everywhere? Or, uh, no, no, that they uh, form a regular sequence. Ah, they form a regular sequence. Um, it's, it is easier, yeah. But. We'll, uh, we'll do everything in, in this general, generality as, as stated. Do you, do you ever really need to consider the uh, convergent case, or will you just, just deduce it from the formal case? From the formal case? Probably you could deduce it from the formal case, but the proof in the convergent case and in the formal case is identical. Simply, you, you do exactly the same thing. All right, so that is the first theorem, and I will postpone the proof a little bit and state the second theorem. Theorem two. Theorem two. Each power series. in a n is equivalent to an element in a n minus 2. So we take power series in variables x1 up to x n minus 2 and take the polynomials in the remaining two variables. So, as a corollary, which follows immediately from theorem 2, we have the following. Each power series in A2 is equivalent to a polynomial.
is equivalent to a polynomial. Okay. So I have the statements of two theorems, and now I will try to describe the proof. For the proof, it is necessary to introduce one more matrix of a similar type and one more ideal. Okay, so suppose that I have this F arrow and that I have lambda, a pitopole of integers, positive integers. Pitopole of positive integers. And then I'm going to introduce M F arrow lambda to be the following matrix. This will be a submatrix. So F1, Fp, Df1, Dx1, Df1, Dxn, Dfp, Dx1, Dfp, Dxn, Lambda 1, Lambda P, 0 here, 0 here, okay, and 0, 0. So that's the matrix. And I, F arrow, Lambda, this is by definition the ideal in AN generated by the P plus one by P plus one minors of M F R O lambda. All right. And one more time, if F is epsilon F1 lambda 1 Fp lambda P S in star, then I introduce J star of F to be I lambda, this ideal. And the comment is identical as in the case of this ideal. This ideal does not depend on the way I represent F in this form. So it is something universally defined. Okay. Lemma. Lemma. The first part of the lemma is I F arrow lambda is contained in I F arrow. That is a straightforward uh, thing to do to deduce this inclusion. That is essentially linear algebra. This is linear algebra. And the second part of the lemma, it's not so trivial. The radical of this ideal is the same as the radical of that ideal. And I don't know how to prove this using just linear algebra. Uh, the proof that I know of is uses Hilbert's Nullstellensatz. So first of all, the first remark is that we can assume without loss of generality that K is algebraically closed for the proof of the equality here. And then we can use the appropriate form of, of, the, of the Hilbert Nullstellensatz. If K is seen, then it is, and we are talking about convergent power series, then it is just the standard Hilbert's Nullstellensatz, which gives us this. Equality. In general, it is an appropriate form of uh, Hilbert's Nullstellensatz. 
Good. With this, I can associate a certain number. This equality allows me to associate a certain number with F arrow. L F arrow, lambda. This is by definition minimum, minimum of L in Z greater than zero, positive integers, such that I F to the power L is contained in I F lambda. So this is well defined. And this number is actually quite, uh, quite important if you want to understand uh, weak k determinacy of uh, power series. So uh, let me pose some questions. I don't know the answers to these questions. The solution is not necessary for the theorem, of course, but it would be nice uh, to know this answer and then the theorem would assume a nicer, uh, stronger form. Does there exist? Exist a constant C, which depends only on N and P, such that L of F arrow lambda is bounded by C. Question two, a weaker question. Suppose that for some reason the answer is negative. So does there exist a constant C which depends on something more? Depends on C, uh, depends on N, P, and F arrow, such that the same thing holds. So here, I'm saying that the constant should not depend on lambda. Should not depend on lambda. And still a weaker question. Does there exist a constant C which depends on N, P, F arrow, and lambda, but in a specific way, namely depends only on the sum of lambda 1 up to lambda such that the same holds. I don't know the answers. And probably these questions are not completely trivial because if you analyze a special case, So let me analyze the questions in a special situation to show that probably they are not completely trivial. So suppose that P is equal to 1. So F arrow, it is just one function, one power series. Okay, this situation. And then we have only one lambda. Lambda is a positive integer. And then what is I F in this situation? If you look at the definition of I F, you realize that this is the ideal generated by F and the partials of F. If you look at I, F, lambda, it's easy to see that in this case, it is the ideal generated only by the partials.
but we know from Brianson and Skoda that the end power of F belongs to the ideal generated by the partials. So Fn is in the ideal generated by the partials. So in the reference to question number one, of course, as C, we can take N. So that's a constant which depends only on N, actually. So even in this situation, the existence of such a universal constant is not a trivial issue. And in general, I don't know. All right. OK, I would like to recall Tougeron's implicit function theorem. Although it is a conference on Artin's approximation, and usually Tougeron's theorem is the one of the steps in the proof, nevertheless, just to have a convenient reference, I will recall the statement. OK, so Tougeron's theorem. So here are the assumptions. Suppose that I have systems of variables. x is x1, xn. y is y1, yp, say. f of x1, xy is a system of a q-tuple of uh, power series. f1, x, y f q x y so these are power series convergent or or uh, formal doesn't matter and let's suppose that we take f prime y so that is the jacobian matrix of f computed with respect to y so i differentiate only with respect to y and then substitute x0. So that is the Jacobian matrix. Jacobian matrix. And i is the ideal in an generated by the q by q minors. of the Jacobian matrix. OK, and let us take one more ideal. And assume that this is an arbitrary proper ideal, different from the entire ring. Then the statement is, If fi x0 is in i prime i squared for i from 1 to, to q, then there exists a solution y of x, y1 of x, yp of x, such that yj of x is in i prime i for every, for every j. And, well, it's a solution, so f of x, y of x is equal to 0. So that's a very classical result. And now, Let's make use of it in the situation that is considered today. So,
Lemma. Let F arrow be F1, FP, G arrow, G1, GP. So these are elements, P tuples of power series. Let lambda be lambda 1, lambda p in z positive to the pth power. Let epsilon be in k star. And let, finally, f be equal to epsilon f1 lambda 1, fp lambda p, and g epsilon G1, lambda 1, GP, lambda P. So these F1, FP do not have to be irreducible, nothing like that. This is not needed. If FJ minus GJ is in M squared, I, F arrow, lambda squared for J from 1, up to P, then F is equivalent to G. Proof. The proof is immediate. It's a, an immediate application of, of Tougeron's implicit function theorem because we can introduce new variables. So X will be as before, of course, X1 up to Xn, Y, Y1 y p z z1 zn and let's introduce capital f which has components f1 fp and the last component is fp plus one which will have a different uh, which will be of different nature capital f j x y z is by definition 1 plus yj to the power, to no power, fj x plus z minus gj of x. Here j is from 1 to p. All right. And finally, fp plus 1 of x, y, z is by definition 1 plus y1 to the power lambda 1, 1 plus yp to the power lambda p, minus 1. OK, a trivial observation, which follows right away from the computation of the partial derivatives, if you compute the Jacobian matrix of capital F with, with respect to Y and Z. You obtain and evaluate this at X, zero, zero. You get the same thing as M, F arrow, lambda. This is just a straightforward computation. So that's it. And then, let's look at f, j, x, 0, 0. So that is f, j of x minus g, j of x. And that is in m squared, i, f, arrow, lambda, by assumption. OK, by assumption. And, of course, if I take the last component, so this is for all j from 1 to p. If I take the last component, fp plus 1, of x, 0, 0, then this is identically equal to 0. This is identically equal to 0. And then I can apply to Jerome's theorem. I can solve for y and z. I can solve for y and z. So, f of x, y of x, 
z of x is equal to zero. Sorry? So yes? Uh, the difference f j minus j gj is, is the problem m squared times i squared. Uh, I said yes, absolutely, thank you. I need that to, to apply uh, to Geron's theorem, of course. Yes, thank you. Okay, so, of course, y i of x is in m, in m squared, that's enough. Actually, it is in m squared times this ideal, but this ideal is not important in this situation. And the same thing is true about z j is also in m squared. So in particular, we have 1 plus y j of x times g j of x plus z of x is equal to Oh, sorry, f here is equal to gj of x, j from 1 up to p. Okay, but this is a change of variables because z of x has components in the square of the maximal ideal. So I'm changing variables here. If I raise the left, both sides of this to the power lambda j, then multiply for all j from 1 up to p, I will obtain simply f of x plus z of x is equal to g of x. Okay, so indeed f is equivalent to, to g. Okay, so now How did you get rid of that right there? How did I get rid of the one right there? Okay, I will say it in a moment. Is this visible? I don't have my glasses. <laughs> All right, look at the last equation, fp plus 1, if you substitute y of x, z of x, then 1 plus y1 of x to the power lambda 1 and so on, all this will be equal to 1, right? So I will get rid of, uh, of these uh, uh, factors. All right. And now I'll state theorem three, which is a refined version of theorem one, one implication. The implication B implies A in theorem one. So let F be in A n, F of zero equal to zero, F different from zero, F epsilon f1 lambda 1 fp lambda p as in star let also l be equal to l of f1 fp lambda 1 lambda p this is this exponent that I introduced when I talked about the ideals i of f and i of f lambda. And 
if the k -th power of the maximal ideal is contained in j of f, then f is weakly weakly k determined. Uh, is weakly, sorry, not k, 2kl plus 1 determined. And the proof of this is immediate because proof Okay, so by definition, J star of F, the ideal that I introduced over here, it is in, in this situation the same as I F1 FP lambda 1 lambda P. All right, and we know that M to the power KL plus 2 is contained in m squared j squared j star f squared. It is so because of the definition of L, right? That the appropriate power of uh, j j of f, Lth power of j of f is contained in j star of f. So I obtain this condition. And that's it, because if I take G, which is epsilon, G1, lambda 1, GP, lambda P, with the property that FJ minus GJ is in MKL plus 2, then it is enough to, to apply the last lemma. According to the last lemma, it follows that f is equivalent to g. But that is precisely what I wanted. So, this theorem implies, implies this implication. Okay? So I proved theorem 1 with the exception of the last implication which was omitted. Now, let me tell you how to prove this theorem. I will do it in three minutes, I hope. So, theorem four, a slightly more general statement. So let f be in a n, f of zero equal to zero, f different from zero, if the height of the ideal jf, so ht denotes the height of the ideal, is equal to n minus k, then f is equivalent to an element in a n minus, sorry, a k x k plus 1 x n. Proof of this. So the proof is proof is as follows. I take i which is by definition m squared j star f squared. The height of this ideal is by assumption n minus k, so the height of this ideal is also n minus k, the height of i is also n minus k. Okay? So, this condition tells me that the height of i is n minus k. But then, if I apply a linear change of coordinates, I can always arrange the situation so that, so after 
a linear change of coordinates coordinates we can assume that a n is i plus a k x k plus one x n well that is how you choose uh, that is a standard result in uh, local analytic geometry that you can choose local coordinates so that this condition is satisfied but then the problem is solved because I can find gj in ak xk plus 1 xn such that fj minus gj is in i i as here and then i apply my lemma and i know that if i take if i take g which is well if f is epsilon f1 to the power lambda 1 f p to the power lambda p and g is by definition epsilon g1 lambda 1 for the g's that i have found here gp lambda p then it follows that from the lemma that g is equivalent to f so i proved this statement and then as an exercise which is not hard you can show that if you take an arbitrary power series satisfying this condition then the height of this ideal is 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 at least two is at least two so the height of this ideal is always at least two and therefore you get the second theorem as a special case of that thank you Conditions uh, between uh, those uh, hypersynthesis F, Fi for this condition to be satisfied. For uh, which condition? Uh, the assumptions of the theorem. The assumptions of theorem of theorem one. Okay. So let's look at the definition of, of the ideal. And to simplify things, let's suppose that we are dealing with convergent power series over C. Okay? So this simply means that the rank of this matrix should be, uh, should be equal to P of the origin, right? Of the origin. So in particular, it means that the Milner number of F1 is finite, the Milner number of P FP is finite, and if you consider this hypersurfaces except the, at the origin, then they intersect in a transverse way. So that's the interpretation. So in particular, this is complete intersection? No, no, no. no. Well, so the answer was given. <laughs> well, I think that for theorem 4, one should also uh, give credit to Shiota. Oh, yes, of course. I'm not saying that I proved everything here. And the results were obtained by several other people. My contribution was to give a simple proof. Uh, and perhaps generalize things a little bit to arbitrary fields and the formal situation. Um, if you compare the proof given by Shiota, the, the proof given also, because in the complex situation, the pr proof was also implicitly contained in the paper by Servo and Matei. If you compare how uh, Servo and Matei and Shiota proved things and see how simple this argument is, then probably you, you agree that the proof is simpler. And the other thing is, 
So we are far away from getting kind of normal form. Oh, yeah, but maybe not too far. <laughs> I would say pretty far. I mean, if you look at the, at the base space of the semi universal definition of an isolated singularity, that's very similar in spirit, and there you hold, and you have a certain uniqueness, at least at the tangent level. So, my hope was always to get a, a normal form, at least on the infinitesimal level. But I, perhaps, perhaps it is not so. But one would have to refine for the whole argument. I don't know how to do it. We've got a question. Can you, can you improve the theorem two? Or you can be In theorem two, uh, this statement here. Uh, no, the answer is no, because, for example, if you take power series in three variables, in his talk, Adam gave an example of a power series in three variables, which is not equivalent to a polynomial. So if I could improve this statement, if n is equal to three, then this theorem would mean simply that uh, every power series is equivalent to a polynomial, which is not the case. So. Uh, you cannot put more variables here in this polynomial part, in general, of course. You have to work under the assumption that something like that is satisfied, and that is not always true, not for every... Uh, this is... Well, this is true under only, uh, for only for special f, if you take k different from, from n minus k different from 2. 